Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to Voluntary Life. This episode is about startups, and I thought it'd be fun to show you a discussion with some startup entrepreneurs. We had this chat a couple of months ago, and we were talking about good books for startup entrepreneurs. Um, and the two books that we talk about are The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki and Rework by Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. And the two ventures that are mentioned in, in the discussion are choreplan.com and knowitapp.com. And I'll put links to these in the show notes so you can find out more about the books and about the ventures if you're interested. The special guests in the discussion are David Albrecht and Nash Yielding. And just as a bit of background to the guests, David Albrecht is a freelancer and entrepreneur. He founded choreplan.com, a web application that organizes and tracks chores and thus promotes harmony and peace in shared flats. Among his other projects is the event calendar flyermojo.com. Nash Yielding is the founder of Sunday 2.0, an organization committed to personal development. Nash is also a philosopher entrepreneur interested in topics from psychology to horticulture and lucid dreaming. He has six years of experience studying the psychology of financial markets, and he created CaringWitness.org, a community website dedicated to ending child abuse. So that's a bit of background to um, the guests, and I hope that this is also useful for anyone uh, thinking about um, starting a business, um, because the ideas, uh, the, the books are, are really recommended, the ideas in them are very useful, and um, so I hope you enjoy the discussion. And thanks so much for listening. I, I guess one of the reasons I thought it might be fun to talk about this book and just entrepreneurship generally is as a way to be more free, obviously just working for yourself and building your own business. I, I'm a huge fan of and I think it's a fantastic thing to do. And then I guess there's levels of that. There's obviously being a freelancer and, and just having the opportunity and the freedom to to do your own thing. And I mean, I certainly during the business that I set up, I certainly met a lot of people who were, I mean, sort of entrepreneurs, but in the sense that they were freelance consultants, they paid their own way and they had their own work whenever they wanted to. And they had a lot of freedom um, to decide whether they wanted to work um, and or whether to just take some time out. And so, you know, they had also very low um, capital costs. They had very low running costs. So they could easily choose, particularly like software developers and, and uh, business consultants and so forth, they could choose to do more or less work, which is one way of doing it. And I mean, I, I certainly have seen a lot of people get a lot of personal freedom that way. I guess this book, The Art of the Start, and also some of the other approaches in, in rework and stuff is more about actually setting up a business um, that scales a bit more than just um, your own occasional occasional work, which is, I guess, the difference to the kind of unjobbing approach. And we were just talking about the first part of the book where he he talks about what it's going to take to actually make that work. And one of the things, he was, as I was saying, is that he really focuses on you've got to be, you've got to have a sense that what you're doing is meaningful, but you've also got to have a clear idea of of what the point of the business is. And there's quite a nice section in it about, he goes through like all of the mission statements of these various companies and just points out how totally useless mission statements are because they're just these completely long and rambling things about, you know, being in partnerships and synergies and leveraging this, that, and the other. And and he makes the point in the book that you, re like, but he suggests in the book that if you are going to start a business, you need to be able to, explain like within sort of two or three words what the whole point is and it needs to be something that you can actually everyone can really identify with so the example he has in this one is that he reads out the mission statement for wendy's which is this long and complicated rambling rambling thing about being in partnerships and synergies and so forth when really you know he suggests that what nobody working in wendy's is going to actually really know that or understand anything about it and if you were starting wendy's what you'd be trying to do is make healthy fast food and that would be the whole kind of point if you see what i mean and i think it's true that i certainly when i started my business i actually found it very difficult to 
very, very succinctly define what the business was about, literally in two or three words, like not a mission statement, but just, you know, what is, what is it really about? It's quite hard to do in a, in a very, very simple way. I guess in my business, you know, it was delivering pedestrian flow. That was what we were, that was what we were being um, hired for, was to help developers to, you know, change the, their design so that they would get enough, enough uh, pedestrian movement to support their shops and everything else. But it, it's, uh, it's not easy to do. And, um, I mean, I wondered, David, I was thinking, like, I know you're obviously creating um, a website, and I think it's a, a really interesting one. Do you have any thoughts about how you would summarize it if you, if you had to about what, what, uh, what it's really for? Yeah, I'm always, uh, to be honest, I'm always having a little bit difficulties to to describe what my website is doing. <clears throat> but the basic idea is um, to um, apply a market uh, solution for for a uh, yeah, pretty everyday problem. That is, um, if you share a flat with somebody else, and, uh, you know, the, the shared rooms like the kitchen and the bath and everything is... Um, <clears throat> It's always dirty or something, and many people um, choose to, uh, at least here in Germany, they choose to uh, s try to solve this problem with a pretty, what I would s uh, describe as a status solution, to put up rules, like um, this flatmate has to clean this part of the um, yeah, of the, uh, this, the bath or something on this particular day. And I um, created a website um, that doesn't need any rules, that simply um, yeah, uh, applies a market situation where every job that has to be done um, has a price and you can decide to, um, whenever you have a free time, you can uh, pick up a job and, and do it. And then you get um, you know, the price into your account. And, um, and yeah, that's the basic idea. And... Uh, as you can see, I need like three minutes to explain what it does, and I'm sure uh, um, um, yeah, that could be improved. <laughs> <laughs> it's so difficult. I know exactly. I know exactly how you feel, and um, yeah, I, I went on with my business for years before I could explain it in in you know less than less than two paragraphs. I think it's a really fascinating website that you're developing there, by the way. And I mean, I presume that in terms of the ideas in this book. Like, tell me if it's if this is totally off track, but I presume that really what that is about is something like resolving conflicts between housemates or making flat shares more efficient or more peaceful or easier or something, you know, because it's um, although you've got all, all of the sort of technical side of it, which is about a market based solution and there's auctioning, auctioneering of different chores within the household and people can bid on it and all that kind of stuff at the end of the day presumably you know what it is that you're actually selling is that this will make your household either more peaceful more efficient easier or something like that you know yeah exactly i i very much like the the peaceful aspect uh, you you men mentioned i think that's um that's actually what i um should say first when i just uh, try uh, try to um you know describe my website because i really believe that it i mean at least uh, I, first i developed it for my flat and it really helped to um resolve uh, yeah conflicts here in my uh, shared flat and um and that's what i yeah what i hope to achieve with that yeah in a way because like everyone understands from the user point of view, everyone understands that when you share a house with other people, you get into these boring arguments and who did the washing up and did you go shopping and blah, 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 and here's a rotor and all of this stuff. And everyone hates that. And I guess the pitch is really, you know, we bring peace and harmony to flat shares, basically. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And in that sense, you could have other things that are not just about the household chores but maybe about also shopping and sharing budgets or i don't know there could be other you know other ways in which you could develop your business further that could be as well as doing the chores presumably there's another side of it which is the whole financial side which is whenever you have a flat share 
you all have to share money and pay for the bills. And then it comes to, you know, did somebody pay more for the telephone or less? And so, you know, I'm sure that you could scale. If, if what you're doing is not just we provide an auction service for chores within a household, but if it's the idea is we help you uh, live peacefully, coexist peacefully in flat shares, then, you know, you can add the other things that people have conflicts about like money and bills and, and these kinds of things. And you could actually, uh, in future, have you know, different, different products that, that, um, that could be part of the same, uh, same website. Wow, that's a really good idea. Um, I added at least the, um, the uh, opportunity to, to, you know, if, if somebody um, shops something for the, uh, for the whole um, shared flat to consume, um, Then, then he can can add the expense into into um, the account as well. I at least added this feature, but uh, that were some. But the other ideas you you brought up, Jake, are, are really good. I um I'm considering these. Um, I will consider this. Awesome, awesome. And I must um I've been very busy, but I still would really love to catch up with you. You know, in more detail about what it is you're doing because I, I think it's really exciting, really interesting. Are you actually? charging anything for, for what you're doing um no uh right now i i'm not i i have another website where um a totally different web website uh, where i'm already charging a little bit and i, I make a li uh, some money but i'm not charging anything yet for my um for my uh, chore plan website um because uh, i i I don't have an idea yet how to how to charge my 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 uh, my best idea right now is to maybe uh, make a I want to to the basic service uh, must be free because people have to get to know to it I believe um, but maybe I can uh, um, charge for a mobile application because um, people often want to have it on their mobile phone and ask me I got lots of requests about that and but i haven't developed a mobile application yet but maybe this would be a good way to to um start charging yeah because i think that is um i know that this is something that um that rework um the other entrepreneurship book that that some of us have um, have looked at oh, in fact you've looked at that as well i think because uh, i remember yes I, yeah i still have your copy jake yeah, cool um, cool <laughs> I remember, I mean, one of the things that they, they say in that book and also that this guy says, which I also think is a really valid point, is that the whole business model, the whole idea of, of working out how you're actually going to make money out of something is so absolutely crucial. And, but, and he makes the same point in here that they make in Rework, which is that the thing about things like Facebook um, is that they are, we know about them because they are unusual. Because, you know, businesses that become huge before anybody has any clue about how they're going to make any money, it's just so unusual. And that it's, it's so, it's, it's tricky, but it's so important to work out, as he puts it in this book, like where, who your customer is, you know, and how you're going to get the money out of their wallet, which is your money in their wallet at the moment, how you get it out of their wallet and into your bank account. Basically, what the steps are between... It, that your money being in their wallet and being in your bank account, as he puts it. And I think that's a really, really tricky one, um, but, but super important to, to work out um, as soon as you can. Because I think that's definitely a, you know, a really interesting business in what you're doing. But uh, the question is, who, who pays and when, I guess? Well, just, yeah. just to jump in, I have, I have actually a few points on what you were just talking about, Jake. And this is kind of tying in more of the rework stuff. And first of all, like, I think it's really interesting when you see these companies that think they can just, like, as the rework people say, flip on that money switch. And a lot of times that has to do with advertising and grabbing those ad crumbs. And that is uh, it's really interesting because that puts a, a secondary barrier in between you and your users. So your users don't become your customers and the, user, or the, the customers are your advertisers. And so a lot of times that just makes a bit more of an abstraction between you and the people who are actually using your product. Yes, absolutely. And I think that is the problem with um, business models that get too sophisticated, where it's like, well, the end user isn't going to pay, but somebody else is going to pay and so forth. It does become um, further and further, as you say, further abstracted from the people using, you know, who, who are your real users, your real customers. And, um, you know, and this is another thing that I, I think they say in Rework, but it's also in this book, 
it's so much easier to actually make a good product if you eat your own dog food, so to speak, if you're actually doing something that you want. And that's very much the case with David's business. Uh, David, you've built something that you needed, which works really well. It was more difficult for me because the business that um, I did was not was was geared towards quite large companies, and so you know it ha- had to be something that it was harder to get a real sense of what the value to the end user was because I don't build massive urban developments, and so you know it was it was more like trying to empathise with what they needed. But I think especially when you're doing consumer stuff, it's um, it's really important to both stay close to. Um, the customer in the in the actual as your actual um, end user, but also for you to understand what it is that, um, that the product's supposed to do and to be using it yourself. Right, and a point that Jason Fried made in a video that I saw once, uh, one of the authors of Rework, is that we get good at what we do a lot. So, like the companies that get a lot of venture capital funding and then have to go hire a bunch of people and get a good office and all that kind of stuff they're practicing spending money, so they're going to get very, very good at spending money, whereas a company that bootstraps and kind of needs to make their own profit from the, from the beginning and be profitable, if not from day one, from very early on, they're going to get, they're going to get good at making money because they're practicing making money. And I really, that stuck with me with, with what Jason Fried wrote about. Yeah, totally. I mean, this book, Guy Kawasaki's book, The Art of the Start, he's actually a venture capital partner. so. He's very much doing it from the perspective of, you know, if you want to get investment, here are some thing, thoughts about it. But I really respected what they said in Rework because I think it is true that if you build it yourself, then you really understand cash flow from the very beginning. And, you, you know, you, you totally, you are by, by necessity very sensitive to making sure that you're doing the right things on that front. And it's, um, whereas if you get a huge cash injection, it's very different. I mean, I didn't get investment of that kind. I did take out loans, but I knew I had to pay them back. And I think it's very different if you have, um, if you if you do get venture capital. And uh, yeah, I, I would go. I tend to agree with what the guys in the rework say that if you can avoid it, by all, um, it's it's best to not even think about it. Have any of you guys actually had any um, any other thoughts about you know businesses that you are interested in starting or things that you've been considering doing? Um, I know that uh, personally, um, I see myself kind of gravitating towards the you know the one person shop consultant kind of um, thing. But I, I did take a, an interest in this book because um, um, I also feel a strong desire to collaborate with other people. And, and so I'm very curious about ways that I can um, kind of start out as a, a one person shop and then move that into a, a larger business that incorporates um, more people and, and involves more um, work collaboration. I think that um, when it goes from one person to two, two or more, that's that you start to have to uh, apply um, a lot of the, the concepts that are involved in this form of entrepreneurship that's described in the book. Right, yeah. I really like the idea that you've got about starting off as doing a, um, a sort of, um, you know, having a freelance consulting type role and having the freedom to do that um, because, as I said, I've not done that myself, but I've seen people do that. And, you know, you can make a really good living and be very happy doing that. And in a sense, there isn't any point in doing anything different to that unless you actually have an idea which requires more than you to do, you know, because if it just requires you to deliver what it is you think is is good, then you don't need a business um, beyond yourself. But if, if in doing that, you start to create some kind of solution that scales a bit more or whatever, then, you know, then there's actually a need for a company and for, you know, for a big adventure involving, you know, hiring people and so on and so forth. But if you can avoid hiring people, it's totally worth doing so because it's a major hassle and it's really stressful as well. So, you know, if you can just do whatever you want to do on your own, fantastic. Yeah. And I think that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in in certain aspects of the software field, and I think that it's it's typical that people will sort of um, do this, you know, consulting thing, and then they they might they might along that way come up with that idea and say, um, hey, you know, uh, here's this tool that I, I use every day that I kind of put together myself. It really helps me do what I'm doing. Um, I bet it would really help other people 
how about I, you know, try turning this into a, a product that I can sell to other people that are, that were doing what I was doing before. And I think that, um, uh, you know, that, that certainly that kind of case uh, applies, you know, well outside of the software field as well, but um, it, it's a, a way of, uh, Getting to really understand uh, a customer base uh, gives you a way to uh, sort of a path forward in, in terms of generating useful ideas for uh, businesses and, and, and all that. So I think that, that it gives you a lot of um, there's a, there's a, there's a potential for a lot of resources uh, in that in that particular path rather than just trying to um, take a great idea and, and go on from there. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, I was actually going to bring up this fellow when we were talking about, like, flipping on that money switch to, like, figure out how to make money. Um, but I actually um, – it's a fellow. He runs one of the most popular uh, Mac blogs, Apple blogs on the Internet, uh, John Gruber, right? Uh, he uh, runs DaringFireball.net, and he, like, wasn't making money. He was just writing on his Mac blog for years until it became, like, the most popular Mac blog. And then he tried to figure out how to make money, and it took him, like, three or four goes before he could figure out. Like, he tried, like, locking down his RSS feed uh, um, so that no one could read his RSS feed without, like, paying a subscription and then, like, now, if you ask him about that, he would just be like, that was a really terrible idea. And so it, I find it interesting, like, he's now making money and it's profitable. But, yeah, that's another example of, like, someone who, he's succeeded now, but he, he was doing the whole free thing and figuring out how to make money. But just an example of how difficult it can be to flip that on switch. Yeah, but also he started it because he wanted to do something that he felt passionately about, right? And so in that sense... He's an interesting example because he obviously put a huge amount of effort into all of those blogs and everything before he'd even worked out how to make money out of it. But it did meet, you know, there was definitely a need there. I mean, this is the weird thing about it. You've got to identify something that people really do need, but you've also got to identify a way of getting them to pay for it. <laughs> and right, both, right, right. And both of those things are absolutely important, but they're, they're, they're actually separate problems. Right. Well, and something that um, that Gruber talks about, um, not to make it all about him, but it's just, he's just on my mind right now, is that he'll talk about, like, obsession times voice. So find out what you're obsessed about. And this is more with writing, but I think it's also with business. Like, find out what you're obsessed with and then multiply that by your special voice. What can you say that's interesting and unique about that topic? And then you've got a niche, right? So in the same way with business, I think this can be with the Guy Kawasaki stuff, is, like, find out something that you are really passionate about and then find out the interesting angle that you can do with this thing that no one else has tried before. And then you've got something. Yeah. Yeah. And he makes an, in this, in the art of the start, he makes a quite a, um, a simple sort of um, suggestion about thinking about like where you, where you're placed, which is that um, if you think about it in terms of a grid of value to the customer, um, and on one axis and how many people there are doing it on another axis you want to be um or sorry yeah sort of fewer the fewer number of people doing it you want to be in the area where you've got very few people doing it but it's extremely high value to the customer whereas if you are in an area where it's high value to the customer but there's lots of doing people doing it you're going to be always fighting on price it'll always be price competition and if you're in an area where it's low value to the customer and you're the only one doing it, then it's just stupid because nobody's going to want it. And if you're in an area where it's low value to the customer and there's loads of people trying to do it, then that's he makes the point that that's what happened in the dot-com boom, was that there were people setting up businesses, like, and like there were 20 people trying to sell pet food online. Um, so it was hugely competitive, but nobody wanted it because the cost of shipping pet food is so much that it doesn't actually make sense as an online business. So, um, so you know, there's all of these companies trying to sell dog food online, um, but there wasn't even there wasn't even a sort of defined market for it. So it's a question of finding something that you really believe in that is really valuable to the customer and that nobody else is doing it, and that is quite difficult to find. So Nash, are you um, are you thinking of setting up a business, or what's your what's your interest in entrepreneurship? Um, actually, right now I am working on a uh, web startup with a couple of friends here in Raleigh. Oh, awesome, awesome! How's it going? Um, pretty well recently. I've been um, 
piecing together a user interface prototype over the last week or so that is just really simple and has a couple of the really basic functions that we're trying to start with and um, showing it around to a bunch of friends and trying to get their feedback on it. Um, and actually today I've set it up so that um, the first feature is actually sort of launched as an alpha on our URL. Cool. So what is the, um, what's the business for I and mean, what, what, what is it that you are offering to people? Um, well, actually earlier when you were talking about the business mantras, I was, uh, I was thinking of what ours is. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think ours is, um, something like democratizing learning through personalization. Wow. Democratizing learning through personalization. Mm -hmm. Cool. So how does the personalization work? So you start out with, um, with your profile, your profile dashboard, where you build a knowledge portfolio of the things you know and the places that you learned them. This is your, like your sources. And you build it from there one step at a time through, um, through your engagement with the content sources. And it's that engagement, which is a big word for like, um, commenting and writing your own blog posts about it or um, writing summaries or reviews or whatever, where you demonstrate your understanding of that content source right. and uh, develop a reputation for being an expert in that area or having knowledge in certain, in certain areas. And then you can use that reputation as a kind of extension of your resume because the normal resume with your college transcript and your places that you've worked, um, it, it's going to leave a lot of stuff out, things you learn on your own. You know, you learn a lot about philosophy, but that doesn't show up on your resume or anything. So and you may not want it to, but it just depends on, you know, there are a lot of things that you learn that are really, um, really useful and really economically valuable that won't be on your resume and are really hard to put there at the moment. So we're trying to make that a little easier. Oh, I understand. This is what you mean by democratizing in this, in the sense that, so this is a way of like showing, demonstrating that you know stuff without having certificates from a specific institution. Is that right? Yes. Yes. The democratizing comes from, um, I, I think in the end, we're competing with universities on certification. Right. Right. So it's basically self certif It's like kind of a self-certification type of thing, but only yes. with the self-certification that sort of works so to speak without just like you know oh yeah i've got a phd from the university of nowheresville that, that uh, sold it to me online type of thing yeah and i promise i read this book when i was 12 or whatever right right i see yeah oh that sounds really interesting and is it is it something that you um is it something that you um are using yourself or like how has it come about um well, I mean, right now we're still in the pretty early development stages. So, um, like I said, I've got this kind of really basic alpha that I've got a half a dozen people signed up for. and They can log in and basically just add URLs of, of sources where they get information. So, like, the URL of a TED Talk that they watch or of a uh, article they read or blog post they read. Um, nice. And that's what you can do right now is just add it. But we're trying to use that as a way of gathering information about the kinds of things people are going to be adding so we can develop a sort of ideal profile of a normal user and use that to influence our interaction design. Wow. That sounds fascinating. So this is you and a couple of friends doing it? Yes. Right. And is the idea for this to be a commercial venture? Are you trying? Yes. Are you going to make money out of it? Right, right. Yes. And have you, have you thought about how you're going to make money? Well, our, I mean, obviously we can create some really targeting advertise, you know, advertising, really targeted advertising through something like this because we'll have a very detailed graph of what people know and are interested in. Um, right. But one of our early ideas for monetization, um, it's still kind of vague, and, and we've had some people really critique it, and we're not really sure if it's going to work out, but um, something around creating a connection between content creators and the content consumers. So like our users will, not, will pretty much be content consumers by and large, although by engaging with that content and writing their own blog posts and stuff, they'll actually be creating content as well. Um, but, you know, connecting people who we normally think of as content creators, like the New York times or um, 
you know, whoever, people who make podcasts or educational videos like the Khan Academy, perhaps connecting them with their users and um, giving them more information about, about like broadly demographics of their users and what their users are interested in other than their um, content, but also giving them the opportunity to interact with their users directly through our platform in a kind of anonymous way, but directly so that the user's identity is hidden from the content creator unless they don't, unless they want it to be known, but they can also interact in a really personal way. Right. Right. And we could charge the content creators for that. Yeah. It sounds really interesting. I really wish you all the best of luck with it. It just, I mean, this is um, just a thought that occurs to me that it reminded me of the book um, instead of education by John Holt. I don't know if you've read it, but it's a brilliant book about, well, basically alternatives to to school and, and university. And one of the points that he makes in there is that, because I've just, sorry, just before I go on to that, right? So you really, what you, your business is all about is proving without certificates that people know stuff and know yes. and have skills, right? Yes. And so you will be giving people a way to prove that they have skills without having gone to an official college and got a stamp. And yes. one of the things, that, one of the points that he makes in instead of education is that the way that schooling used to work um, in the 19th century and, and so forth was that there would be um, the teachers would just teach some kids and those kids would teach the other kids and the other kids would teach the other kids so that all the way through the classroom in the same room you'd have different age groups and they'd all just be teaching each other and part of the whole point of that was that you actually do know something if you teach it to somebody else then you really know it if you're if you're answering questions about it and you're teaching it to somebody else then you actually really do have that skill right and what i was just thinking is that you might one way that you might want to think about your business is that if the users are interacting in terms of blog posts and um, i don't know like um uh uh, message boards and so forth if they are providing knowledge to other people like either through direct teaching or by answering queries or whatever then effectively they're demonstrating that they have the knowledge right and if those other people could rate that person then you know let's say that this was a skill that you were trying to get people to demonstrate that they had certain knowledge in certain computer languages or whatever without going going through official certification then in a sense, if you had a way for them to be rated by a diverse group of people who were not just their two friends or whatever, then that person could show that, look, I haven't got a certificate, but here's all my ratings for having helped other people learn about X. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. That's, um, that's actually a, a big part of the plan. Um, because there's, there's like several different things you can do with knowledge. And one of those things is communicate it with others. And that's going to be one of the major pillars of our reputation statistics for people. Cool. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Have you read the Instead of Education book? No. That, I think, like, is all about what you're doing. That book is all about exactly what you're doing. So you might find that an interesting book to read. It's called yeah. Instead of Education by John Holt. And it was written ages ago. But he is... Um, talking about alternatives to compulsory certification learning. And he, he, he's got a lot of stuff about um, examples of, um, uh, you know, other ways of doing things, which really I think could, could fire off a lot of ideas in terms of the, the way that you're approaching it. Hmm. Yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Cool. Well, I would really love to hear how things progress um, as, you, as you move forward. So, um, so yeah, and like I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm just launching a kind of, I guess, really early alpha today um, with some of the, just like the most basic feature, and we're doing some kind of security testing and that kind of stuff on it. But, um, you know, I guess as, as we add features to that, the, um, I'll keep widening the net of people who, um, you know, people who can come and sign on, I guess. And uh, I know Greg mentioned wanting to be, a, or, you know, some interest in being an alpha tester and that kind of thing. So. I'll definitely be keeping you guys in the loop on what's up. Oh, fantastic. No, I'd love to, I'd love to hear how, about how it's going. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to, 
um, to see, you know, how things develop with yours and with David's and, and um, well, with all of you guys, really, um, how, how things uh, move forward. I'd love to see how things go. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned John Holt and you know, some of the, like the unworking stuff and you know, I mean, we go about the unschooling stuff. And the, a lot of this project, for me at least, is motivated by trying to solve the problem of why, like the practical barriers to people doing something like unschooling or teaching themselves. Um, I mean, there's a lot of just intellectual or ideological barriers people have or just not knowing that it's an option. But there are these kind of practical barriers around certification where if you're a business hiring someone, I mean, you got the choice between somebody with a resume that has a GPA and a college on it and somebody who doesn't, it's definitely faster for you to just have a, you know, a, a policy in mind that says if, if they don't have a college degree and they don't have a GPA above 3.2, throw it in the trash. Yeah, you know, it's, just like, absolutely. It's, a, it's an inexpensive heuristic. And it'd be really nice to create a competing heuristic that says, yeah, they may not have a university and a GPA listed, but here's the uh, pass key to their know it profile. You can go there and get some detailed statistics on them that can tell you if they're qualified for your position or not. Um, or at least view as reasonable of you know, a reasonable of an idea as a resume does about whether they deserve an interview. Yeah, I think that sounds like a fantastic, um, fantastic idea. And definitely, given how totally broken the, the whole education system is, um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting one. Absolutely. I think it would be really cool to, uh, to you know, chat again if you guys are up for it um, a little way down the line and see how things are progressing um, with your businesses. I'd be very interested to hear more. Yes, that sounds really great. I would be up for that too. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, guys. It's been really fun hearing about uh, hearing about how things are going, and uh, and um, yeah, very very excited about the businesses that people have talked about. And uh, yeah, great to get your thoughts on the book too. So um, thanks very much for coming along, and look forward to chatting to you all soon. Good night. <laughs>